caring enough to come out on a Saturday afternoon to hear some of our Muslim neighbors speak and hear their stories, uh, hear the straight scoop about Islam, and hear them speak about some of their experience as American Muslims in these days. My name is Frank Burton, and I'm uh, representing Star King Unitarian Universalist Church. This uh, event is sponsored by the new Eden Area Interfaith Council, which, okay, sometimes we have good things that come out of bad things that occur, and this is an example of that. Some of us have been wanting to have some kind of interfaith organization in the Hayward Castle Valley area for some time, and it just hadn't been happening. But with the racist stuff that Donald Trump has been broadcasting nationwide, and the thing that happened in Castle Valley of the woman attacking some Muslims that were praying in the park, uh, out of that we've come together. And there's, there's really quite a bunch of, of faith, faith groups that have sponsored this. Uh, I'm just going to read them all, and if you're if you're from one of these organizations, why don't you just stick your hand up for a minute? Star King Unitarian Universalist Church. There's hardly yeah, there there are only a few of us here from that church because we have a memorial service for one of our longtime members that's going to happen at two o'clock this afternoon, and so most of our people are already over there, and I'll be leaving myself in a few minutes to go over to that. Eden United Church of Christ. Hands up. Okay, several people. Uh, let's see, UCC of Hayward. I guess that's different from UCC. Eden. Congregation Charami. Okay, several people. Gurdwara Shahib Sikh. Okay, that's one of the organizations that is organizing this. Alameda Muslim League. Our Lady of Grace Catholic Church. Several people. Okay, and then I'm going to let. Uh, Munir, read the rest of these because I'm afraid I'll mangle the names of them. So I'll read the mosques real quick. Uh, uh, we have the American Muslim Association in Hayward. He's a, this is part of the uh, Interfaith Council, the Indian Area Interfaith Council. We have the Alameda Muslim League. Uh, we have Masjid Abu Bakr. And we have Mosque Bahadjani. So those are the, uh, and uh, you mentioned memorial service. <coughs> Alright, so I was Billah Mir Shaykh Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. So my name is Mudif, and I'm the mosque representative uh, for the Eden Area Interfaith Council. I'm Muslim. I like to call myself a born again Muslim. Uh, it's uh, traditional for Muslims to begin their gathering with, by saying a prayer in Arabic and then alienate every single person in the room. I had to introduce this panel uh, earlier this month when I was making the flyer. And uh, I really thought, you know, we suffer from a perception problem uh, as a Muslim community. Uh, every week I meet positive, generous, you know, uh, people that, that put out awesome, positive, positive vibes at, at our mosque and our, in our community. And yet we get defined by this 0.0001% of nut jobs around the world. Uh, so, you know, this line about all, all terrorists are Muslim except the majority of us who are not. <laughs> So we definitely have a perception problem, and that's why it's so important for you to be here and, and see us as we are. Uh, so this panel will share their experience uh, in a spirit of unity, of learning, uh, of inquiry. And we know from our own life and our knowledge of what it's like to be a human being given by the world, that we live in a culture that we're often educated by messages uh, that we often wish we would not be, not be educating messages. So it's events like this that are important because they give us a chance to fill our lives with more accurate information. Uh, and that allows us to be better allies, better supporters of the world of peace. And, and that's important, and there's a lot of fiction and myths out there about Muslims. So we want to start out before the panel with the 11 minute video uh, about the facts versus fiction of um, American Muslims. And then we'll start with the panel. So, uh, lights mostly off. So, what are some of the stereotypes you've heard people saying about Muslims? Muslims are terrorists. Muslim women are oppressed. You know, go back home. Uh, you're a foreigner. Not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. Muslims are un-American. They're all Arab. The Quran teaches hate. Such stereotypes are widespread, but are they true? In recent years, there have been dozens of polls conducted worldwide and right here in the United States. 
American Muslims are an integral part of our society. We see Muslims in media, in comedy, in acting, in medicine, law, engineering, business. They're engaged in politics. They're engaged in they're starting their own organizations that are benefiting the community. So Muslim Americans are really tapped into almost every sector imaginable. They are job creators. 24% have started their own companies. American Muslims are largely middle class and mainstream. American Muslims are like other Americans, with comparable percentages watching entertainment television, following professional or college sports, and recycling household materials. The U.S. government estimates the American Muslim population at around 7 million. There are Muslims who have immigrated from literally every other part of the earth. It would be impossible to talk about Muslims in America without talking about African Americans. So you have an extremely diverse pool of ethnic and national diversity. They are as likely as the average American to attend a religious service, as likely to say that religion is important to them. They're actually slightly more likely to believe that people of other faiths have a chance at salvation. According to Gallup research, American Muslims are the most likely faith community to condemn attacks on civilians. They're also the least likely faith community to sympathize or say that it's ever justified to attack deliberately killing civilians. Now that's the reality of American Muslims. Unfortunately, the perception among many in the public is totally different. Only 27% of Americans polled have a favorable view of Islam. Some might say that the reason for this is obvious, but is it? Most Muslims reject violence, but that's not what the West media focuses on. So you can have hundreds of Muslim leaders denouncing violence, and that would never make it to the newspapers or on TV or anywhere. Certainly it's a fact that there are some Muslims out there who want to do harm to others. But I've seen nothing to suggest that Muslims as, 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 as a community um, or, as, or Islam as a religion is more likely to lead to people to violence. Terrorism in America is, is sort of almost a melting pot. There are a lot of different types of, of motivations that drive terrorist attacks uh, in the United States. Very few of the, the attacks that have actually been carried out have been motivated by uh, Islamism. I think a lot of people have this have a misunderstanding that uh, Muslims are, are carrying out attacks and they're always targeted at, uh, at Christians or at non-Muslims, but it is much more often the case that their actual victims are Muslims. According to the National Counterterrorism Center, Muslims worldwide are the main targets of extremist violence and are between 82 to 97 percent of those killed or injured in terrorist attacks. Then, why are Muslims mainly presented as the perpetrators of terrorism rather than as the primary victims? Why don't more Americans view average, faithful Muslims as the true representatives of Islam rather than the extremists? If you feel that other group is threatening, you impute all kinds of vice and evil you reduce them to stereotypes, and often you use the most extreme member of the other group as a representative of that stereotype. What fear does to people, according to neuroscience, is it, it increases their acceptance of authoritarianism, conformity, and prejudice. The result is the marginalization of Muslims in America's civic, social, and political life. Society is telling them that they're not a part of the American society. They're not a part of the fabric of this country. In a 2010 Gallup poll, almost half of all American Muslims reported experiencing racial or religious discrimination in the past year. So let's ask again, are these negative perceptions fair? The extremist quote from the Quran, isn't terrorism in the Quran? The Quran does speak about terrorism. But it uses a very specific word. In Arabic, it's called irjef. And this word irjef means crooked action to instill fear and violence in people, but 
that fear and that violence is based on hypocrisy. So according to the Quranic uh, paradigm, terrorism or extremist behavior is really an acting out of hypocrisy. Muslim scholars have written a letter to the leader of ISIS. We are appealing to him by using Islamic knowledge and Islamic teaching to say, this is not what Islam is all about. What he is teaching does not represent the teaching of the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran says that whoever take a life of innocent person, as if have taken the life of all in humanity, and whoever save one life, as if have saved the life of all humanity. The Quran clearly says there is no compulsion in religion. You can't force anyone to convert to your beliefs, whether they're political beliefs, economic beliefs, religious beliefs. The Quran obviously uh, is very clear about the sanctity of life and respecting everyone's freedom to practice. Whoever wills, let them believe. Whoever wills, don't let them believe. Clear cut. One of the first things that any student of the Islamic tradition learns growing up is the prophetic tradition that says, show mercy to those on earth and the one in the heavens, or God will show mercy to you. And that's really the cornerstone of what Islam teaches. Out of my childhood, having grown up as the only Muslim American family in a strong conservative Christian community, I found that for us as children and young people, it didn't matter the color of our skin, or the faith that we follow, that we came together based on a shared love of God, our shared values. One third of American Muslims report working to solve a problem or improve a condition in their community. 75% have donated to or assisted local charities. Muslim doctors decided to establish a compassionate network of medical professionals who provide medical services and health care free of charge to everybody to a person of Islamic background, Jewish, a Christian, or person of no faith. There are more than 20,000 Muslim physicians in the United States, and they operate over 100 free medical clinics around the country. So we're actually seeing Muslims respond to Muslim extremists with the teachings of their own faith, basically debunking their actions, their extremism, with the core teachings of what Islam really is. What happened in North Carolina when these three Muslim students were killed was really traumatic for the Muslim community. And instead of just responding with uh, a, a statement of condemnation, um, they responded with love. And a campaign came out of that to feed our local hungry. And within one month, we have nearly 300 mosques, Muslim student groups hosting camp food drives around America to feed their hungry neighbors. When there have been national disasters, American Muslims have helped provide relief. Answering the call of their faith, they serve and sacrifice for their fellow Americans in many ways. Muslims are involved in every aspect of the United States of America. They're not the problem, they're the solution. Fear has become toxic. We have to unite. Islam really is a cohesive, complete paradigm of way of life. Uh, and when you take it all, then it makes sense. You can coexist with others. Uh, you can build wonderful things. You can collaborate. You can be part of civilization. One of the most beautiful stories that I love of the Prophet Muhammad is his first statement upon entering Medina after suffering years of persecution in Mecca. His first words to the people of Medina were to spread peace, to feed the hungry, maintain ties with your family and to pray at night when others are sleeping and if you look at that statement it's pretty amazing because the first three things are all about your relationship with other people it didn't say this to feed the hungry muslims it didn't say to spread peace to muslims only but it's really about connecting to humanity uh, before even your personal connection with god it was your personal connection with other human beings Every day, the beliefs of American Muslims are called into question. Don't be fooled by the actions of extremists. Speak up against unfair stereotypes. Share the facts about American Muslims. They represent the real truth about Islam. For more videos and information about American Muslim facts, 
visit AmericanMuslimFacts.com. Hashtag Muslims in America. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so this short film, So this short film provides uh, you know, scientific research uh, to, to answer kind of the most frequently asked questions about Muslim, our Muslim neighbors. And uh, so that's a great website, AmericanMuslimFacts.com, if you'd like to learn more about it. Before the uh, panel started, I was, uh, somebody shared with me this, this article that appeared, uh, this is the Philadelphia Trumpet. And uh, you know, it's supported by the Clarion Foundation. And you know some of the researchers here in the Bay Area, they, they did a study about the Islamophobic network in the U.S. Uh, and they spent about 119 million, 119 million a year to uh, kind of look around you. They, they spent about 119 million a year to uh, kind of lead this narrative, this, this false narrative that Muslims are not your neighbors and, and all that. So this is a small effort to kind of counteract that, that whole thing. Uh, so I want to do a big interaction with for our, our panel here. You read their bios, and by the way, uh, when you walked in, there was a sheet. Uh, you know, if you have a community organization, a, a group, uh, your, your congregation that would like them to appear, or any other speaker, uh, you can con you can contact uh, them through the, the website there. Uh, so we're really in for a treat. Uh, this is a distinguished panel. I'll let them introduce themselves. I will mention that each of these uh, five speakers will talk for about ten minutes or so. Uh, we'll break and then we'll take Q&A for 30 minutes afterwards. Uh, we're taking break questions, so when you walked in, there you've got a little note card if you have it, it's here. Uh, so please uh, fill out your question and then uh, somebody will be along to uh, pick that up. And um, just a quick reminder before we get started, this is an event that's sponsored by the Eden Area Interfaith Council, which is a consortium of religious groups uh, here in our area, uh, which includes Casper Valley, Hayward, San Leandro, San Lorenzo, uh, and some un unincorporated areas. Uh, this is our third event, and each event we just keep on growing, so we're really excited to see that. Uh, our next event is an interfaith, interfaith food sorting at the Alameda County Food Bank in Oakland on Sunday, uh, March 6th. So we hope to see you at that. And uh, to start, I'll turn it over to Dr. Carson. Good afternoon, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon all of you. Uh, my name is uh, Asad Tarsin. Uh, I am in. Yes, sure. Thank you. I was really enjoying sitting down. Uh, I am an ER doctor by training. I work in an ER in Walnut Creek. Um, and in my spare time, I study Islamic theology, law, jurisprudence, and spirituality. Um, so I have been given the um, nearly impossible task of, in 10 minutes, trying to give you guys a brief overview of um, Islamic beliefs and practices. So I'm going to dive right into it. So putting Islam in context, the way that Islam views itself is a continuation of a succession of prophets sent by God. So Islam very much sees itself as a continuation of Noah, Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Moses, Jesus, etc. It sees itself from within that tradition um, that the prophet Muhammad, um, and we'll get to that, is the uh, final messenger of that succession of prophets sent by God. Um, so to put it in context, the uh, Islamic faith and the Prophet Muhammad don't see themselves as replacing, but rather completing and continuing what has been an ongoing message. Um, in Genesis, there is a story of Abraham um, with uh, Ishmael and Hagar. Um, and when they are taken to the barren valley, um, it's called Mecca at the time, it becomes called Mecca with an M eventually. Um, and that is where the story really begins. The city of Mecca is literally founded by uh, Abraham, the patriarch Abraham, who through him, God creates two great nations, they're both Ishmael and Isaac, and in the words of Genesis, two great nations um, do indeed develop from him. And what, what comes is, uh, he founds what is the first house of worship of the one true God, right? The God of Abraham, sometimes called. And over time and over the centuries between the departure of Abraham and Ishmael and the birth of the Prophet Muhammad in uh, 570 AD, you have that the, the house of the worship of the one true God becomes overrun with uh, hundreds of idols, literally hundreds of idols, 
um, and idolatry becomes rampant. Um, and so it's sort of within that context that the message of the Prophet Muhammad comes. Um, due to time, I'm just going to jump into what is uh, considered the, uh, the most succinct outline of the religion, which comes from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, himself. Um, and so to tell the story, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is sitting with his companions, and a strange man appears. And they said it was a small town, and nobody recognized this, this character who, who showed up. Um, and he was clean, his clothes were clean, he didn't look like he was a traveler at all. But he sits with the Prophet Muhammad, and he asks him, he says, Oh Muhammad, tell me what Islam is. And he asks <laughs> the Prophet Muhammad to outline what are the foundational religious practices. And the Prophet Muhammad outlines the five practices that I'm about to go through shortly. And the man tells him, yes, you have spoken correctly. And the Prophet's companions are sort of awestruck at, well, who is this guy who comes and sits and asks the question and then tells him, yes, you need to answer correctly. And then he asks him, what is faith? So first he asks him, what is practice? What is surrender? And the second question, he says, what is faith? And there, the Prophet Muhammad lists the tenets of Muslim faith. And lastly, he asks him, what is uh, spiritual excellence and purity? And the Prophet Muhammad outlines that. So these three things, so I want to keep I want you guys to keep the framework in mind as I go through it. So faith, right, uh, practice or conduct, and then character, purity of heart. Okay? So faith, conduct, and character form the three dimensions of the religion. Uh, in brief, Muslims believe in six, there are six objects of faith that are universal amongst Muslims. The first and foremost is the, also the most obvious, which is belief in God. So we believe in God. So God is the God of Abraham. So sometimes you will hear people who ask the question, is Allah different than God? And if you, anybody who's, uh, and I'm sure there might be a copy here, if you pick up a copy of a Bible, the New Testament in the Arabic, it will use the word Allah, because Allah is simply the Arabic for God. Um, the Christians and Jews of that region use the word Allah. So it's, they, are, they are essentially equivalent terms, just a different language. Um, but first and foremost is the belief in God. The second is belief in angels. So we believe that God sent angels. Um, and the third is we believe in divinely revealed scripture. So we believe that God sent the gospel, the Torah, the Psalms of David, and the Quran. Those are the four sort of agreed upon um, scriptures that, that have been sent. Um, the fourth is the succession of prophets I've, I've already made reference to. So we believe that God has sent, in one tradition, over 124,000 prophets to humanity. We don't know all of them, right? But we know that there are forms of guidance and truth all throughout the world, and that every people had a prophet sent to them. There are 25 that we know of, and that we confirm and believe in by name, and I alluded to some of them, <coughs> Noah, Jacob, Jesus, you know, etc. Um, but there are five that are sort of considered the prophets of resolve. And they are, we start with Noah, uh, Abraham, then you have Moses, then Jesus, and then Muhammad. And these five form sort of what are called the prophets of resolve. They are sort of the elite of the prophets. Um, and our narratives about the, the, the first three prophets is pretty similar to uh, what most Jews and Christians would believe about them. Um, our narrative for Jesus differs slightly, and I say slightly in amount, not in degree. Right? Uh, I say slightly in that we believe that he was born of a virgin birth. We believe that the Lady Mary, and there's an entire chapter of the Quran about the Lady Mary, was, uh, ha was miraculously pregnant without any human uh, interaction. And uh, he's born of a virgin birth, and he, is, uh, he performs all of these miracles. He brings life to the dead, he <coughs> walks on water, etc. We confirm all of the biblical miracles, and we believe that he is indeed the Messiah, the awaited Messiah. Um, and we call him the Messiah. And we also believe that he comes back at the end of time for you know, unfinished business, antichrist, etc. Et That's a whole lot. I don't, I don't want to get into all of that. Uh, but the the point of departure with what is more modern, I mean, there are earlier Christian sects that I, I think uh, Islam would be more in sync with, is about the divinity of Jesus, which was early on in Christianity. Um, there was some uh, contest of this issue. Muslims believe him to be a mortal prophet. And not the literal son of God, but the son of God in the sense that all prophets were, were men of God and godly men. 
uh, but not in the literal divine sense. Uh, and then the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, is the last and final of those. The fifth uh, tenet of faith is uh, the day of judgment and the afterlife, we believe in a day of reckoning uh, where each of us will stand um, uh, and be, be judged for our sins. And the last is a belief in what's called divine decree, which is essentially a belief that everything that happens in life happens through the will of God and by his permission and leave and has some divine purpose even if we don't understand it. That nothing, even the good and what we deem to be the bad, um, happens outside of God's plan. Um, so that's the faith. Uh, the practices are five. Have you, if you've heard of the five pillars of Islam, it refers to the practices. Um, but again, that's only focusing on one of the three dimensions when we talk about the five pillars. The first is to simply testify. And this is how one becomes a Muslim. Uh, there, so the testimony of faith is a two-part statement which says that I believe that there is nothing worthy of worship other than God, and that Muhammad is his messenger. And those two statements are the, the profession of faith, and by that, a person um, enters the faith. There are some inherent implications there, which is if you accept the prophet Muhammad, you accept Jesus and Moses and Abraham and Noah, etc., they're all included in there, and one's faith would be defunct without it. The second pillar is the prayer, and at five points during the day, Muslim an ego, sometimes the way it's translated. This part of us that, you know, it's it's the part of us that um, has uh, the tendency to be selfish on the one hand and indulge in desires on the other. So it has the uh, the, the vice of anger. Uh, it has the vice of sloth. It has the vice of just all of these carnal desires step from this part of us that is called the ego or the lower self. The concupiscent soul is, is, is what uh, it would be called in the Catholic tradition. The, uh, the corollary to that is at the same time, we believe that Muslims are created with an innate nature that has, through our soul, an inclination to do good. Muslims are created. Everyone. Sorry, is that the bit that I'm speaking? Yeah, Muslims believe that we're created, so we, when I said we, I mean human beings, we believe that we are created with an innate inclination to good. And it's that part of us that cringes when we see something bad, right? That that's not all learned. Some of that is instinctual repulsion at what every human knows to just be wrong or unjust. It's that part of us that feels guilty, right? If we're not desensitized by like seeing something senseless over and over again. But it's that part of us. And so we are taught to undergo um, a process of spiritual purification, which entails purging the vices of that ego, so to try to to try to not indulge every desire or every um, wish to lash out or get revenge or the temper to flare or whatever it might be um, on the one hand, but also to strive to fulfill these virtues of generosity, of charity, of giving, of altruism. And it's by purging the vices and adorning oneself with spiritual virtues that a person um, becomes a complete believer um, and, and worthy of, of this relationship with God. So we have faith, which is right thinking, that you believe that there is a God, that there was a creator, that we are going to a day of judgment. Then there's actions, things that regulate the body, the practices. Um, so it's the mind, the body, and then the soul. Um, so it's these three dimensions that, as succinctly as I could uh, today, really summarize the teachings of Islam. So I'm going to thank you for your attention. Oh, yes, thank you. Sorry. I, I um, and so at the end of this conversation, so the conversation goes, where the question was asked, what is faith, what are the actions, and then what is spiritual purity? And each time the questioner would say, uh, you have spoken correctly. And uh, after the end of the conversation, the man gets up and leaves, and the Prophet Muhammad turns to his companions and says, do you all know who that was? And they didn't, and he said, that was Gabriel. He came to teach you your religion. So he, this is considered, and this uh, tradition happens about 60 days before the passing of the Prophet Muhammad. So this is considered by Muslims to be the uh, greatest blueprint of a complete expression of the religion with faith, practice, and uh, virtuous spiritual composition. Thank you again for your attention. Just a quick reminder, oops, uh, if it's vibrate, put it uh, on vibrate any uh, phones in the room. Right. Uh, and next we have Sarah Kim.
Assalamualaikum with all of you. My name is Sarah Kim. Uh, I live in Lafayette, and uh, my husband and I are business owners, and he also works in San Francisco. But we own Sienna Ranch, it's an educational ranch in uh, Lafayette Outdoor Education. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I'm a manager of a homeschooling co op uh, of about 30 families, and uh, say around 16 to 70 children we homeschool our kids together. And actually, the first year we did that, we did it here in Castro Valley. We rented a home here and did that, and then we moved to Lafayette. Uh, the following where we've been there ever since. So first of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'm both honored and humbled, and more than a little bit nervous to be standing here before you. I'd like to think that we're all here today because we love our community, we love our country, and we love our world. And it's only by knowing and respecting one another that we can elevate our respective communities and our beloved country to the highest levels. Uh, my talk today is very different than uh, Asad. I'm coming from a very personal perspective. Uh, I'm a convert to Islam. I converted when I was in my early 20s in college. And uh, the title of my talk is How It Makes Me Become a Better American. Um, so to tell you a little bit about myself, I was born in Florida and raised in South Carolina in a very proudly American family. But what does that really mean, to be an American? I have to be honest, I don't think I really truly figured out the answer to that question until I became Muslim. I didn't figure it out until the establishment of my faith in my daily life allowed me to live according to the ideals which I am confident most of us would resonate with. Compassionate, being of compassion, integrity, mutual respect, kindness, generosity. These are all the qualities that I think good human beings and good Americans strive to embody. Today, however, with the short time that we have to spend together, I'd like to focus on one topic in particular that I can address with what I hope is a sincere and passionate heart, and that's the topic of racism. <coughs> Growing up, I was very close to my paternal grandparents. I would spend summers in North Carolina with them, and since I was an early riser like my grandfather, the two of us would enjoy a daily 7 a.m. breakfast at a restaurant nestled at the bottom of the mountain where he lived. I was proclaimed his favorite granddaughter, partially because I was named after his eldest daughter, Sarah Jo, who had passed away in a car accident the year before I was born. Apparently, I looked like Sarah Jo as well, so his affinity towards me was clear and understandable to all. And in return, I deeply adored him. He was a generous man who showered love and affection on all of us grandchildren. But the one thing that I remember not knowing how to love about him was his deep-seated racism and hatred for people of color. He openly insulted and disrespected black people. He frequently used the N-word. I remember being really uncomfortable with his attitude and his actions towards blacks. So naturally, I exonerated myself from being racist. I told myself that at least I didn't take after him on this one point. In hindsight, I realized that the post-civil rights era in the South was still rife with unspoken racism. Though there were African Americans in town and in school, we had very little to do with one another. I didn't have any black friends. I didn't live near black people. I didn't sit near black people in class or at lunch. Basically, there was minimal to no interaction between them and us. Separate but equal may have been banished by law, but it was alive and well in everyday actions, even in mine. In my mind, however, I was as all-American as apple pie, blonde-haired, blue-eyed high school cheerleader. My European ancestors landed on American shores in the early days of settlement. My mother is part Native American. I think I'm 1 16th Native American. I lived in southern suburbia and was the daughter of a self-made businessman, attending some of the best public schools in the area, along with church on Sundays, and I had my mind set squarely on attending a service academy after graduation. Who was more American than me? Looking back, I realized that I was knowledgeable and I was mature enough at that point to understand the true embodiment of being an American, but it took me quite some time to get there. In 1996, I had completed a couple of years at the U.S. Naval Academy before deciding military life was not for me. 
I transferred to the University of Maryland and got my degree in civil engineering, married my husband Mike, and had our first son, Ben. Mike was still in the Navy and stationed in Japan. I stayed in the States to finish my degree. It was at this time when I was introduced to Islam. Since my talk is not about my conversion story, I won't go into much detail about how I chose to enter this beautiful religion, but I do want to share with you how being Muslim completely altered my understanding of race. Before I do that, however, I think this would be an appropriate time to share a few of the Islamic teachings regarding race, which come to us via sayings from our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or via verses taken from our holy book, the Quran, which we believe to be the direct word of God, whom we call Allah in Arabic. I'd like you to keep in mind, as I go over some of the teachings of Islam regarding race, the opening line of the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, the document that formed the foundation of our nation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and here's what God says in the Holy Quran. O people, we have created you, male and female, and made you nations and tribes, so that you may know one another. Truly, the most noble of you to God is the most righteous of you. Verily, God is knowing and aware. God also says in the Quran, among his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the diversity of your languages and your colors. Truly, in that, are signs for people of knowledge. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is quoted to have said, Truly, Allah the Exalted created Adam from a handful, which he took from the earth. So the children of Adam come in accordance with the earth. Some come with red skin, some with white skin, black skin, or whatever is in between. Righteousness is the only quality that makes someone virtuous in the sight of God, not race, or skin color, or lineage, or country. This teaching against racism was delivered by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, during his final sermon, the final sermon he gave before he passed away, indicating just how important he believed it was to the true message of Islam. He said, O oh people, your Lord is one and your father Adam is one. There is no favoritism of an Arab over a non-Arab, or a non-Arab over an Arab, or a, neither a red skin over a black skin, or black skin over a red skin, except through righteousness. He also said, a man might say to another man that I am more noble than you. Yet no one is more noble except by the fear of God. So these are just some of the teachings of Islam that slowly began to permeate my life, supplanting whatever complacency I may have had before becoming a Muslim. I was beginning to realize that if I wanted to have any standing before God, I had to earn it through my character and my good works and my awareness of God, what is often referred to as fear of God in my personal life. My skin color and my race weren't going to benefit me in any way. There was one crucial time, however, that these teachings really took a hold of me and taught me the true essence of what it meant to be an American and a Muslim. My father, at the age of 50, was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor, tumor and given two months to live. I wanted to take my young son, Ben, back home with me to South Carolina so that I could take care of my father in his final days. He readily agreed to have me come home, but firmly warned me against trying to convert him to my new religion. I had become Muslim only three months prior. I assured him I would do no such things, and I headed to South Carolina. Interestingly enough, in a very short period of time, after quietly observing me in my worship and noting my newfound mindfulness that I brought to my day-to-day -day life, my father began questioning me about my new faith. Facing death, he was forced to think about his own mortality, so he started seeking answers to the questions of what might be coming after death and what had been the real purpose of life. I tried to answer his questions to the best of my ability, 
but my own limited knowledge of my new religion could not satiate his deep curiosity. He peppered me with questions and I literally ran out of answers. In desperation to provide him with what he was looking for, I searched for a local Muslim community where I might be able to take him so he could speak to someone, anyone, who could give him the answer that I couldn't provide. I searched in the phone book, I asked around, nothing. I could find no Muslims anywhere close to us. Keep in mind that this was all happening in the time before the internet had claimed the ubiquitous presence it enjoys today. I was desperate. For days and nights I prayed to God. Though I didn't know everything about Islam, I did know that one of the irrefutable tenets of the religion is that one condition of prayer is that you have to recognize and submit to the knowledge that only God has the power to answer your prayer. And answer it, he did. One morning, my father stumbled across an ad in the local paper announcing the grand opening of an Islamic center in the next town. He eagerly showed it to me, and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was truly a miracle. God had sent us some Muslims. <laughs> that very next Saturday, we drove to Rock Hill, South Carolina, to meet these Muslims in the hopes that they would help my father settle the affairs of his soul. To my surprise, and honestly, to my disappointment, we saw that the entire group was comprised of African Americans. Not one other white person was in the room. My heart sank, certain that this was a mistake. Deep down, I knew that there was no way my father could be guided to a new belief system through a group of African Americans. It just wasn't possible. He had been conditioned all his life to hate them. But another fact we are taught in Islam, God is greater. Sometimes you'll hear that as Allahu Akbar. When my father emerged from the center, he was a man deeply moved by all those whom he had met. He was a man who received answers to the questions that had remained unanswered for so long, and he was now a man of the Muslim faith. God is truly greater than anything we can imagine. Through the words and actions and sincerity of those whom he had been groomed to hate, he found acceptance, love, and a faith that he would embrace and practice as a means of drawing closer to his creator until his death almost one year later. May God have mercy on him. This is something Muslims say about those who have passed, similar, similar to when people say, God rest his soul, or may he rest in peace. The black Muslim community in South Carolina took very good care of my dad and me. They would invite us into their homes every Friday after congregational prayers. My father would be with the men and I would hang out with all the women and children. Um, the men became an unwavering web of support for my father, teaching him, guiding him, and helping him come to terms with his impending death. While I was comforted by and thrilled with the peace that my father had found, this was actually a momentous turning point for me as well. For the first time in my life, I had black friends. They were more than friends to me, however. They were my sisters. We would pray together, sing together, eat together, and laugh together. It was a beautiful and memorable time in my life. It was a Friday in February, nearly one year after my dad's conversion to Islam, when he returned to his Lord. At the time of his passing, my two-year-old son Ben, an African-American brother named Abdullah, and I were all sitting at his bedside. Anyway, this brother had come to visit my father so that he could read from the Holy Quran in his presence. Muslims believe that the recitation of the Quranic words in Arabic brings solace to the heart and the specific reading of the chapter called Yasin helps ease the soul's passing from this world to the next. It was through the lips of this black man that these verses aided my father's soul. It was the brothers from this community who came to pick up his body. It was they who washed his head and limbs, who perfumed him, who shrouded him, and who prepared him for his burial. They arranged for the funeral, transported his coffin to the cemetery, lowered his body into the ground, and then prayed over him in accordance with the Islamic rituals of burial. There were rows and rows of black men praying for my father's soul. If only my grandfather had been there to witness that tremendous and powerfully ironic scene. Only God has power over all of our affairs. So that was the point from which all of my unrealized racism began to melt away. It was at this point that I became truly Muslim 
and truly American. I understood unequivocally the power of humanity without preconceived notions or discriminatory underpinnings. And upon moving to California, I have continued to be blessed with the most amazing friends and community members from all backgrounds, races, and religions. It is on this premise of mutual respect for all of God's creation that I have found a true kinship with all races and all people. I have been taught that to treat everyone with dignity and respect is an act of worship. I learned, how to, I learned that to clear someone's path of an obstruction or a piece of trash is an act of worship. I have learned that one of the most famous teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that to smile at someone is also an act of worship. Because of our faith, my life, my husband's life, and my children's lives have been elevated, and I hope and pray that we will always be positive contributors to the greater society in which we live. I can surely say, with immense gratitude and humility, that I am a better human being and a better American for it. It is my sincerest wish that my children, along with all the children of our Muslim communities, will lead future generations of Americans based on the premise of God's command to get to know one another in peace and respect and to create a life that uplifts all that is good and suppresses all that is evil. Thank you for taking the time to get to know us and for honoring me by listening to my story. talk about, this is something that, in fact, the opposite I've heard more often, 
which is that there are people, including myself, who put on the hijab in direct opposition to the wishes of the people around them. When I wore the hijab and then took it on about 16 young women, is that it's their own personal relationship with God and trying to figure out how they can live a God-conscious life. The understanding is more of the coming from a position of modesty, and you'll see all different levels of it. You'll see women who wear hijab and wear makeup. You'll see women who, uh, like in, in Dubai, you'll see women who wear the long gowns, but they'll have like little diamonds and sequins all over it. When they go out in the sunlight, they light up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> then you'll see you know, women in Afghanistan who wear the blue, the orcas from top to bottom. In Saudi Arabia, you'll see women who Pretty much the abayas there that you buy, they buy are all black. Uh, so it's affected by different cultures. In Africa, you see something very different, different colors. So, but what it is, the whole spectrum is people trying to figure out how they can be living and dressing in accordance with what they believe that God will find most pleasing. And um, you know, when I went to St. Mary's College in Morocco. You know, I was really uh, struck by all the iconography and the, the paintings of the Virgin Mary, and to me, she looked just as Muslim as any of my friends, you know? So, it's, and we pride ourselves on that. Uh, we pride ourselves that somebody as noble as the Virgin Mary was somebody that, you know, we hope would recognize something in us if we met on the street. Um, but it's just one part of the religion. It's not, it doesn't mean that if a woman wears hijab, she's automatically more pious than a woman who doesn't wear hijab. We were actually requested by a Muslim woman that, can you get somebody who doesn't wear hijab to sit on the panel so that people can see that there is this spectrum of practice even within Islam. It just so happened that um, we're all co-workers. We work together in educating our kids, and all the women in our co-op do wear the hijab. So. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be things that are going to come up in Q&A those topics then. So another um, myth or stereotype I wanted to talk about was the concept of jihad, which many people understand it to be as a, a military form of engagement, which is interesting because jihad from the Islamic perspective is actually a very noble concept, so much so that there are people who will name their sons jihad. And uh, those were the good old days when people didn't really know that much about Muslims or Arabic terms and could get away with it. Now, people whose sons are named Osama and Jihad are regretting it, you know, and having to deal with a lot out there. But Jihad is a noble concept, and it means to struggle. And there's a famous story about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was coming back from um, a battle experience with the companions. He turned to his companions and he said, we go now from the lesser Jihad to the greater Jihad. And his companions asked him, what is the greater Jihad, O messenger of God? That it is the struggle against the self, the struggle against the ego. So that's the highest level of jihad. So whether it's, you know, for me it would be resisting the ch third chocolate chip cookie, that's my jihad. You know, <laughs> for someone else, the jihad might be giving up gossiping or backbiting. Another person, it might be, uh, jihad might be to wear the hijab or to give up smoking. So people have all different levels of jihad, and that's how we understand it too. There is a, a military aspect to it also, but unfortunately that's co-opted the word in the general understanding. I know of somebody, a young man, whose name is Jihad, and he wanted to get a personalized license plate on his car and was denied <laughs> because the understanding is something else now. <laughs> All right. Um, some of the misconceptions that I wanted to address, actually, um, Dr. Elsa did a good job of um, clarifying them. So, not lucky with that, so just like that. Um, One of the misconceptions that's come up, especially with recent events, is about the irrational love that Muslims have for the Prophet Muhammad, if you speak upon it. Um, there's a little bit of truth to that, but irrational love. And it's that kind of love that any of you would have for your parents. You know, if somebody um, slandered your mother or your father, the pain that you would feel, that's the kind of pain that many people who grow up learning the truth about who Prophet Muhammad was, they feel that. But as far as this 
violent reaction that we've seen in some quarters of the world. There's nobody I know who understands that kind of reaction. If anything, what I heard repeated over and over is that the violent reactions we saw was actually more insulting to the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad and who he was, and peace be upon him, than um, any of the cartoons or any of the words that have been said against him. What we've learned from his example literally was the teaching of the Prophet Jesus, and peace be upon him as well, just to turn the other cheek. We have stories about the Prophet Muhammad where you know, he would be walking down this alleyway and every day a woman would throw garbage on him. And this is a story that all our children in Sunday school learn at a young age. Every day when he walked there, he got garbage thrown from a window on top of him. One day, he was walking down the alleyway, the garbage wasn't thrown on him. And he wondered about her, what, the, what happened on that particular day. And when he checked up on it, it turned out that the woman was ill. And so he actually went to go visit her and asked about her and, and prayed for her to get better. That's the story that we've grown up with. Many countless stories like that. And so when we hear about people who uh, react in, with forms of violence, all we can assume is that these are people who are uneducated, who don't know the truth about the Prophet Muhammad. There's you know, political reasonings behind why they're reacting the way they are, maybe they're disenfranchised, or it's just an excuse to be a thug. Um, but as far as Muslims and what they know about the Prophet Muhammad, they love him. It hurts them deeply to hear him being slandered or spoken about in, with lies, but not to the point where anybody would want to actually take up arms. And this kind of love goes for all the prophets. Islam actually sees itself as a reformation. A lot of people will say, oh, Muslims need to reform their religion. Islam actually sees itself as a reformation. And one of the reformations are some of the biblical stories about the prophets that we are taught as Muslims um, are, are incorrect. Stories about Lot having slept with his daughters, or stories about prophets getting drunk, or prophets committing sins. Muslims believe that prophets can make mistakes that are corrected by God, but that they don't actually commit sins. And so they're, they're held in a very high, high esteem. And there's one opinion out there um, in, the, in the Islamic tradition that says that even Mary might have been a prophet. So these are people who are very revered, and we're living in a time when um, it doesn't feel like much is sacred anymore. And so you will see that, um, you know, from Muslims especially, that they'll be out to defend these noble people. So those are just some of the stereotypes I wanted to address right now, and I'm going to hand it over to my kid, Kim, and then we'll come back to Kim.
and that trying to understand the created universe was one of, if not the prime motivation of their respective life's work. Now this was quite a statement. Up to that point, no one had ever told me that the greatest minds in the Western civilization were believers in a created universe. On the contrary, in public schools, this very interesting fact is completely left out and deliberately avoided. I later came to find out for various reasons, a subject matter for another time. Nevertheless, I saw this as an astonishing discovery, that the most revered, widely studied, and respected minds in the Western civilization were believers in a God. Further, that their life's work were inspired by their desire to know the created universe. Another example of a spiritual jolt during my college was in a probability statistics class during my sophomore year. A professor challenged the class to derive a statistical number that can approximate the chance occurrence of a simple blade of grass coming into existence based on its component parts. Very few got it right. In fact, I don't think anybody did because it was such a huge number. The right number was bordering on infinity, meaning that the probability of a blade of grass coming into existence by pure chance, given the vast number of its component subcomponent parts and the variances associated with billions of particles coming together so precisely and in such exacting sequence so as to create a complete life system were so remote that by mathematical reasoning you landed on the doorstep of an intelligible cause behind the blade of grass coming into existence. So then it didn't take much to imagine this, the statistical probability of more complex life forms such as animals and humans and the celestial bodies that contain them. So, there are many other academic experiences, such as the ones mentioned, that inspired me on a personal quest. If the, if the vast majority of the most eminent thinkers, philosophers, scientists, and mathematicians believed in a creator, it seemed logical to me that I would benefit by looking into the matter myself. So I continue to read, study, debate, and search out answers to the growing number of questions and conflicts that I accumulated during my college years on the subject of religion. And in the end, I left college with two firm conclusions. Number one, the observable balance, harmony, and order of nature of the universe strongly indicated that there's only one God. Number two, in a created universe, divine matters must necessarily take precedence over all human and earthly matters. Armed with these two convictions, I began my journey of trying to discover the right religion or system of belief. As a consequence of my academic inquiry, however, I established what I believed was a relatively high bar for a system of belief that I was willing to adopt. For example, on a scientific level, I was in search of a religion where science could not disprove God, since matters of God superseded and eclipsed matters of man and the universe in the self-evident relationship between the creator, thus superior, and the created, thus a subject. A standard I held fast was one where sound scientific discoveries could, one, never disprove God, but rather support the existence of God, so as, as in the statistics example. And number two, that all scientific discoveries would always lag behind and ultimately validate revelation. Similarly, in terms of social elements of the religion, I held fast to the idea that the outward practice of religious ceremonies needed to reflect the core teachings of the religion to be true and relevant. Any incongruence or conflict between his teachings and ceremonial practices were to me an indicator of corruption or distortion. A good example of this in Islam is the Friday prayer service and the five daily prayers. In the Friday prayer service, everyone of all background prays in a straight line, rich, poor, white, black, brown, shoulder to shoulder, facing one of the earliest places of worship built by Prophet Abraham and his son Ishmael, known today as Mecca or Holy Sanctuary. To me, this weekly prayer ceremonially and symbolically reflect the teaching of the quality of man before the Creator. And the prayer service is identical here in the Bay Area as it is in Cairo, in Jakarta, in Mumbai, or London. In terms of practical benefits, the five daily prayers are a good example. I saw this as supportive practice in carrying out the religious teaching of God consciousness. That is to say, if your day is organized around the mandatory five daily prayers, before sunrise, midday, late afternoon, sunset, and night, you can't help but be conscious of God in between the prayers when you are busy in worldly affairs. And in terms of philosophical standard, take the concept of equality again. The very notion of equality, absent a creator, is illogical to me because no two human beings are equal, whether in intellect, strength, wealth, health, height, or any other standard or measurement. 
we are rendered equal logically only when the creator of all declares itself from the perspective of the creator. Another philosophical example was that absent the reality of an afterlife, heaven or hell, our lives are inconsequential in the big picture sense. We can only truly live a consequential life if we are held to account for our deeds here on earth. So it gave real meaning to the religious teachings of be good to your neighbor, be responsible stewards of nature, care for the orphan and the elderly, feed the hungry, since these acts would have eternal consequences. It was, it was clear to me that the belief in divine judgment of our deeds here on earth was an effective way of encouraging humanity to live a more virtuous and noble life. So I had a pocket full of these kinds of standards and concepts that were important to me. And after graduating from Annapolis, one of my personal missions was to explore the world for a religious system that would allay these concepts to my satisfaction. I traveled extensively aboard Navy ships as an officer, visiting over 30 nations and sailing across all the major oceans and seas of the world. I did my best to study and learn the different religions of the world, but none of them did it for me. Nothing met the standards that I had defined or adequately addressed the questions that I had. All during this time, I was, of course, aware of the religion of Islam, but I didn't want any part of it. Like so many other people from the West, I was filled with less than favorable impressions of the religion based on a steady diet of negative imagery, misreporting, and misrepresentations of Islam. So I simply dismissed it out of hand. It was my wife, Sarah, who impressed upon me the importance of looking into this religion in a balanced, and fair manner, and open mind. It also helped that I had a few important aha moments. For example, I read that there are 1.7 billion Muslims in the world, which meant that one in four human beings on earth is a Muslim. A casual logical deduction was that anything that 25% of humanity embraced must be redeeming and worthwhile. So in time, I started to learn about Islam. Islam not only met, but exceeded all of my standards. It answered all of my questions, sorted through all of my conflicts without any equivocation or qualification. Not only was it easy for Islam to address my questions and concerns, it did it so effortlessly that my issues seemed trivial and basic. The many preceding years of study and struggle with all these unresolved ideas, questions, and concepts were all easily, clearly, quickly, and unequivocally answered by the tenets of Islam. Everything made divine sense and logic. Very soon I was confronted with the fork in the road. I knew in my heart and mind that Islam was the right religion for me, yet I still felt that to be a Muslim would be very challenging in America. In the end, however, the penetrating and overwhelming truth of Islam was irresistible. Eventually, I made up my mind that I was going to embrace Islam. At that time, I prepared myself for the inevitable difficulties ahead once I made my public declaration of faith in becoming Muslim. Interestingly, nothing happened. Or I should say, nothing bad happened. On the contrary, I received nothing but support and good wishes from my family and friends and colleagues and no ill will or negative comments from my family, both immediate and extended. And frankly, my life, social and otherwise, was markedly improved. In closing, I would like to add that I've been a practicing Muslim now for about 20 years, and in that time, I've met many Muslims from one coast to the other. I've attended countless conferences and gatherings, large and small, public and private, and I have never heard anybody say or promote ideas that would categorize as extreme, militant, or un-American. On the contrary, these gatherings are all about how to be a better person, contribute to our community, and support our nation. So when I regularly hear the news of terror cells in our communities or radicalization in our mosques, I, don't, I simply don't know who or what they're talking about. I do think that playing to people's fears and anxieties for political monetary gain does happen. It's happened throughout history to countless other communities, but doing so is harmful to our great nation as well-meaning citizens. Thank you. smiles and I want to share a smile with you too and I think that's one of the most important things we can achieve today. Um, I am your neighbor 
It's called Getting to Know Your, your Muslim Neighbor. And so I am uh, a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for 10, 11 years. Um, I was with Dell Corporation, corporate counsel. So if you have a Dell or some software related, I might have done a contract related to that. Um, I have three daughters, um, seven, five, and three. Born and raised in Chicago. I love basketball. I'm going to watch the Super Bowl. I'm going to eat some fried chicken. <laughs> Barbecue sauce. Yes, I'm an American. I'm Muslim. Um, I do want to sit, really thank you, genuinely thank you for coming today. It means something to me personally as an American who lives here. I've been here my whole life. And I don't know where else I can possibly be. Unfortunately for me, the first time in my life I ever thought of feeling unsafe is just these past few weeks. I've never felt unsafe in this country before. I've never felt unsafe in my life before, except for these past few weeks. And so I thank you for, for coming and addressing that for me personally as a fellow American. I actually bring my daughter everywhere I go. I bring her everywhere I go, but to be honest, I was a little worried to bring her here today. But after seeing all your smiles, I was wrong. So thank you. Um, and finally, as your neighbor, my goal in life is not to be a rich lawyer, not at all. I promise you, my goal in life is to make as many people smile as possible. So if you can help me win, can everyone smile? <laughs> everyone? All right, closer to my goal. Thank you. So I'm a lawyer. I have three girls. I'm American, as American can be. But what is American? Is this hat American? Yes, it's absolutely American. If I take it off, it's un-American. If I take off the hat, it's un-American. If I want to wear it, because what? In America, it's wear what you want, right? Right? Be comfortable, be different, right? So if I take off the hat, that's un-American, right? Or do, you, do, you, do we want everyone to dress the same and talk the same and look the same? No, that's not American, right? So wearing this hat for me is, is American, right? And I mean that. I mean that. Right? I don't know where else to go in this world. If I, actually, when I went to other places in the world, even though I speak Arabic, they can right away tell just the way you walk, you know, facial expressions, you know what I mean? Where are you from? I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't even say anything. <laughs> They're like, you're not from here. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I'm American. Can you say something in English? <laughs> yeah, sure. Just don't ask me to say the bad words. That's what they want you to say the first thing. Like, I don't say those words. Right? Okay. So I, I'm also, know your Muslim, know your neighbor, I'm also a Muslim. I'm also a Muslim. But that doesn't make me any less American. Yes, I'm Muslim. And, and, and I will tell you that over these holidays, I gave all my neighbors cookies. I gave 20 of them cookies. Some of them didn't, weren't really happy, right? Because they didn't like the name on it, you know? Mahdi. Right? They couldn't pronounce it right. But I gave like 20 homes neighbors, right? 20 neighbors cookies. Right? And so I'm Muslim. And just like Mike was saying, I've been Muslim my whole life. I've been in the intimate circles of Islam my whole life. The ins and outs, whatever flavor you're going to what you're going to hear about Islam in America, I've heard it and I've been there. And we need to shift it right now. Muhammad, as Muslims believe, after all, the, all, after all the other prophets, peace be upon them all, said something which is very dear to me and I want to share it with you. And he said, He said, None of you believe until you love for your brother or sister what you love for yourself. And let me tell you what the interpretation of that means. It's your human brother sister. It's your human brother and sister. You are my brethren and my sisters in humanity. From our Muslim tradition and our Muslim perspective, you are my brothers, my sisters, my aunts, and my uncles in humanity. Right? And we all share, we're all related to a prophet from our Islamic tradition. We're all related to a prophet. You are prophetic. 
You have prophetic heritage. And I mean that. You have prophetic heritage. We have prophetic heritage. Who? Who am I referring to? Any guesses? Adam. We are all endemic. We are all related. We are all human. We are all a part of the human family. And, and we are brothers and sisters. Right? So there's not this them versus us. We are related to the same father and the same mother. And we are related. Yes, we have crazy uncles. <laughs> yes, we have wacky uncles. But they don't represent us. We're people who want goodness for one another. Right? We are also, we also share something else other than our Adamic father. We also share our American forefathers. The forefathers of this country who built one of the most amazing things in this world. One of the wonders of the world is America. And they built it and they designed it because they are brilliant, genius people and they made something amazing. And it's my country and it's our country. Right? And so we are related to our forefathers and like Dr. Martin Luther King said, we need to continue their legacy and not let it fall. I don't have the quote. It's actually... We have a great dream. It started way back in 1776. And God grant that America will be true to her dream. Everyone say amen. Amen. God grant it. And I have this, by the way, because it just came in the mail yesterday. <laughs> so I was looking at it, and I was like, oh, that's perfect. I'm going to use this today. <laughs> right? So I'm taking my daughter with me to Egypt um, and to Algeria and to Turkey. I'm going to these three countries because all of my, some of my cousins and aunts and uncles who are now refugees scattered throughout the world because my parents emigrated here in the 60s from Syria. So they were all comfortable living in their homes and now they're all refugees scattered around the world, right? And so I'm visiting my aunt in Egypt and my grandma in Turkey and an uncle in Algeria because they're all scattered. Yeah, that's my time? To membership. Yeah, that's my time. All right, cool. So I'm taking my daughter with me, and so I got my passport yesterday and visa and all that. Okay, so that moving, moving on, the them versus us principle, closing that out, there was a, a Harvard study that came out in 2015 that answered the question, who is setting our agenda? Who is setting our agenda? What do we think about? And they proved through scientific studies that who's setting our agenda, what do we think about? It's actually media outlets very conservative, very, 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 very conservative media outlets. Not only that, they prove that they're setting the agenda for Congress. It's crazy that they're setting the agenda for Congress, right? So we need to be careful. We're not going to be susceptible to that. We're rejecting that paradigm. It's we. We are Americans. We are part of this human family. Finally, I, I was tasked with the responsibility to address the elephant not in the room. <laughs> Not in the room. Who said that recently? Anyone here said that recently? <laughs> Megan Kelly, right? Yeah, so it, so it says in our program, the elephant in the room, the crisis of ISIS, these nut jobs, right? So I was tasked to address that. And to address that, in addition to what was already said, I, I, I want to ask you guys something. What percentage of our DNA do we share with apes? 98.8%. Do apes represent us humans? Apes represent humans more so than these nut jobs represent Muslims. Are you with me? I'm just happy real. These are nut jobs. And like I said, I know Muslims very intimately. And like, I don't know anyone who supports them, right? But it's not our fault because the media is setting this agenda, right? And I'm going to be very real with you. The numbers don't lie. I'm going to share some numbers with you. Since 2011, how many people were killed by Muslim terrorism? Since 2001, in America, how many in America, since 2001, since 9-11, the tragic incidents, how many Muslims were killed by terrorism? 75. How many acts of terrorism happened 
that's about there. So the percentage in 2015, how many shootings were there? Mass shootings were there in 2015? 351. How many were Muslim? Three. Now, if you do the math, if you do the math, the number of times we hear or see images or hear about Muslim terrorists compared to the number of acts perpetrated by Muslims, based on the number, it's about 200, 200 per, per person who suffers harm. If we were to aggregate that, based on the percentage caused by Muslims, every day, every day you would hear about non-Muslim, are you following me? You would hear about non-Muslim terrorist acts about 3,000 times a day. Are you with me? Yes. If, you were to, if we were to talk the same amount about non-Muslim terrorists, the same we talk about Muslim terrorists, you would hear about non-Muslim terrorists about 3,000 times a day. Are you with me? Right? So the numbers don't lie. The numbers don't lie. Right? Um, there was a Duke study that said, who reports suspicious Muslim activity more than anyone else? Can anyone guess? Muslims! There was one time there was an FBI informant in Los Angeles and he was undercover. And then he came and he was trying to plant these ideas with Muslims and plant these ideas with Muslims. Guess what? They called the FBI, and they said, there's this dude, he's suspicious. And guess what they were telling him about who? Their own guy, and who called them the Muslim? And it was CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, that called, right? This is, these are true stories, I'm not making this up. How many Muslims are in the U.S. military today? 4,000. Do you know that defending, time's up. Sorry, I'm taking more time. I love you. Um, do you know that when fighting British colonialism, George Washington had Muslims in his army? His names were Bambit Muhammad, Bambit Muhammad, Yusuf bin Ali. These were fighting next with George Washington. Do we know that 25 to 33 percent of Muslims that came from slavery were Muslim? Right. So Muslims are part and parcel of this society. Now going back to the elephant, not in the room, not in the room, right? Um, if we look at the civilizations and percentages of Muslims killed, the, the per capita, historically, we will see that Muslims are less violent than other civilizations. If we compare civilizationally, civilizationally, Muslim civilization compared to others, we will see that Muslims have the least number of murders and killing. I, I, the numbers don't lie. The numbers don't lie. In the 21st century, we killed, humanity killed over 200 million people. 200 million people, right? Muslims are the least percentage civilizationally towards the bottom than all the other, right? So the numbers. Finally, addressing this, and forgive me, uh, finally addressing this elephant not in the room, I want to just say, I want to just tell you that these nut jobs that are apes and less than apes, forgive me, um, <laughs> But what happens is, why do they do this? Because they have these issues, very, very unfortunate issues, where they, they dice the methodological issues of how to understand a text. So for example, if I were to tell all you guys, do not, do not walk in that room. Do not walk in that room. And then you go and crawl. <laughs> Did you follow the instruction? Did you follow the instruction? Okay, so you follow, did you follow the instruction? Do not walk in that room. So you go and crawl. Did you follow the instruction? Okay, so this is important. Did you obey? Did you obey? No. Did you obey? Okay, there's the letter of the law and there is the spirit of the law. Right? So if you tell your child or your significant other or something, do not, you tell your child, do not walk in that room, and then he goes and crawls. Are you going to be happy or upset? You're going to be upset, right? Right? So the, the, the idea is these nut jobs, they do one thing. They'll play these like 
they'll, they'll play these crazy games where they do these sound bites, take this decontextualized, decontextualized verse, or decontextualized things, where they don't understand the complete interpretation, they don't understand the context, the meaning of the interpretation. That's number one. Number two, they forget the spirit of the law. You can't forget the spirit of the law. You can't. Do you know how many wacky laws we have in America? I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer. Do you know how many wacky laws we have? Do you know we had law? Uh, you know we had laws that ladies can't use profanity in public. <coughs> no, I'm serious. It's still in the books. It's still in the books. So, right? So, letter and spirit of the law. And so, num number three, they're not qualified scholarships. Qualified scholarships, scholars have requisites. You have to have so many deep requisites, and I can tell you what they are. They don't satisfy. Them. They don't satisfy them. So it's like me taking a brain surgery book and going and conducting brain surgery. No, for real. My dad is a brain surgeon, right? He, talk, he tells me about brain surgery every day. So am I qualified? No, but I can look at the book and the book says, make the incision closest to where the tumor is, and the tumor's right behind the eye, so I stab the guy in the eye. No, it doesn't make sense. I'm not qualified, right? I didn't study for 20 years to become a brain surgeon. And these nut jobs also are not qualified scholars. That's why we saw that letter in that video. They sent, the scholars, qualified scholars, sent a letter debunking everything. And finally, finally, we have in the history of our humanity, of our shared humanity, where Muslims, Christians, Jews, people of no faith lived in tranquility and in peace. We have in our history where scholars have defended Jews and Christians and people of other faiths, right? We have scholars, we have one in our history where we protected churches. We protected churches. Only now these nut jobs, only now these nut jobs, they, they, they destroy a church or a temple because they think they got it right, although all of the last, the scholars of the last 1,400 years got it wrong. Are you crazy? The scholars all over the past 15 centuries protected this church and honored this temple. But you got it right, you scholar today, in 2015, and you're going to blow up this building? You don't understand the purposes and objectives and the principles of Islamic law. And forgive me for taking more time. And I love you all, and we'll see you shortly. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I know we're running over uh, our time here. Uh, this is being recorded, so we will be sending out a link uh, to this if you want to share with your friends or uh, put it uh, join us today. Uh, if you did sign in uh, at the uh, table when you walked in, uh, put your email address on there. It will be emailed to you. A link will. Um, you know, I saw tears in the audience. I saw a lot of interested faces. It, this is a great panel. So let's give them a round of applause. Do a 10 minute break and then come back for QA. Can we do 245? Is that possible? Let's do 245, rest our job, uh, get some water, and then uh, for those that are Muslim, if uh, you have any afternoon prayer, your Zohar prayer, we'll do it after the QA. So we'll have prayer mounts and all. So uh, yeah, please 245. If you have your questions right now, please bring them up to the table, please. Um, and I think it's just, we hear it a lot more, and it's um, brought as a divide sort of uh, within the Muslim community. Not um, the oh. Sorry, the question was, can you explain the difference between Shiite and Sunni Islam? Uh, the, the, it, it's, it's a split, um, about approximately 87%, depending on the numbers you look at, of uh, Muslims in the world are Sunni, um, and uh, about 17% are Shiite. Um, and the difference is primarily um, a theological one that resulted as, like most theological schisms and splits in religious communities, based on a historic event and, and disagreement. Um, to summarize briefly, uh, there is very little difference that most Muslims would be aware of and understand. They, um, they have the five prayers, they um, have the same core beliefs and tenets of faith, they read from the same Quran, the same holy book, they don't have a different scripture. Um, and the differences tend to be in some theological components that deal with um, the descendants and the, and the uh, successors to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, after his death. And then those sort of historic things turn into theological positions about infallibility and all, all types of interesting things if you're into theology. 
Um, but really, what it, and they tend to pray together. I mean, there are mosques that you can go to that are primarily Shiite mosques that a Sunni will go to to pray. There are um, Shiite Muslims that will go to a predominant Sunni uh, mosque to pray. They don't hold those um, kinds of divisions uh, to be to be uh, that different. Um, but they both will call themselves as Muslim. They don't really um, clarify that distinction between Sunni and Shia unless the context calls for it. Uh, geographically, you will have some areas that are predominated by Shiites and they're predominated by Sunnis. And so then you, you get into any time you have um, uh, politics added to the mix, it tends to, you can polarize and pit people against each other and divide and conquer, etc. Whereas beforehand, it really wasn't much of a, of a divide to begin with. Um, that's my sort of 60 second answer. <laughs> Uh, we're taking written questions right now. Sorry about that. You have to write. Sorry. Is it? All right. Sorry. Would you like a piece of paper? Yeah. All right. Uh, our next question comes from the uh, Casper Valley LGBT community. I welcome and support you as our Muslim neighbor. We've been both demonized by fundamentalist Christians. We have also been demonized by fundamentalist Christians. My question is, do you support us? Are we welcome and are we affirmed in your mosque? Will you join us in Castor Valley Pride, and how can you show your support? Probably for Mehdi, uh, LGBT, and Muslims. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to make sure I got the questions, question understanding correctly. Affirm us and you support us as LGBT. Yes, you are welcome in the mosque. Yes, you're welcome in my home. Um, let me know, and I'll cook up some steak. Um, on a serious note, um, uh, this issue, um, it's the, the one's uh, sexual orientation, um, it's, uh, it's not something that uh, is or should be, you know, interestingly today, um, where, where culture, where culture, where we think just is, 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 historically there was always an is and an ought is and ought, where should we be, right? So trying to borrow from the ancients and our, our, uh, our heritage, some wisdom. Uh, so it's what we ought to be doing and what we should be doing, it's, it should not, it should not be a div divisive issue. So yes, it is a sin in Islam. Yes, it is a sin. So um, the interesting thing is, what we'll, what we'll all say, is you're welcome, come, but we're not going to also lie to you. I'm not going to lie to you. You know, I got pulled over. I didn't tell my wife yet. Please don't tell. Me. I got pulled over yesterday, and the officer was like, uh, "Sorry, I know this is bad." Uh, she's like, "He's like, um, who are you talking to on the phone?" I was like, "My father." He's like, "Was it an emergency?" I was like, no. And then he's like, uh, it "Sounds worse than it is." And then he's like, when did you put your seatbelt on? And I was like, after you pulled me over. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to tell you Islam is or isn't something. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to lie. Right? So in Islam, we believe that God created us, fashioned us, all of us. And that he designed for us and he prescribed certain rights and wrongs. Right? And we are tested with different things. So we are tested with our inclination, like Dr. Eshad was talking about, where we have to resist certain things, right? So part of that third dimension of Islam, and, and it's, it's resisting what we may have as a certain temptation. So if someone's temptation is an, a sexual orientation which goes against the tenets of the faith, well, that's a, a test that God chose to give you. And God chooses to give tests to different people in different ways and different forms. Right? So resisting that, resisting that temptation is, according to the Islamic tradition, is something that is praiseworthy. Now, having that inclination is not a sin. Are you with me? Having that inclination, that desire, is not a sin, but according to the Islamic tradition, acting upon it, acting upon it is something that should be resisted as a temptation, like other things that God prescribed in religion as right or wrong. And again, let me know when you want to come over for steak. Can I add something to this just because I think this is it's, it's a great question uh, and it's not easy to answer in a 60 second format the way Matthew did. I just want to add one component to it which is that is not a precursor to getting them all. 
right? That we as a community, I had a really sweet lady, I think some, some folks overheard, who just came and told me that because I don't accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I just told her, I said, listen, and she just was worried about my afterlife salvation, essentially telling me I'm going to go to hell if I don't <laughs> agree with her right here as we're standing in the library. Um, and what I told her, I said, can we just agree to love one another and to wish well for one another and just get along? I don't want her to have to confirm my belief that Jesus was a mortal prophet, if that's what she indeed believes. And I don't want her to compromise on what she actually believes for the sake of community. So I think one of the things we have to celebrate is our uh, mutual respect with, along with our preservation of values. So I don't want anybody to think that if we're honest, it means that we can't get along. Or if I differ with you, that that become, has to become a division. Uh, we can all get together with our Muslims. Yes, we all agree. You know, right? Like really, like Muslims know, right? We don't all get along, but that doesn't, that's not a precursor to living together with uh, love and respect, etc. Thank you. I just wanted to add one thing to that as a Muslim mother. Um, one thing that I've taught my sons, and my son's in public high school now, is I've made it very clear to him that as a Muslim, because he's told me about things he's overheard where kids make fun of gay kids or make fun of anything that, you know, they consider different from them. And I've made it very clear to him that as a Muslim, his duty is to stand up against bullying and, um, you know, outright uh, mistreating people over their sexual orientation because that is what I've made clear to my kids, none of his business, what anyone's doing in their private lives, that he's not allowed to torment them more than that. So our next question is to my sisters, uh, Sarah and Hina. Are there laws or rules about men touching or talking to women in Islam? Sometimes I want to reassure my Muslim neighbors that they are safe here, but I'm not sure. That's a very, very, um, very sensitive and very considerate question. I really appreciate the person that asked that. Um, you know, if you look at old uh, etiquette books, even here in America, the, one of the etiquettes that used to be taught in the old days is that uh, a, a gentleman doesn't shake a woman's hand until she offers her hand. That was like an etiquette that was taught even in the West. That pretty much goes for uh, Islamic uh, gender relations as well. You, uh, men and women physically do not touch each other unless they are related, blood relatives, or they're married. And so Muslim women really do appreciate goodwill and uh, when somebody, when a gentleman stops me and tells me that he really likes my hijab or he thinks it's beautiful, I know he's saying something much more than saying that I have a nice headscarf on. He's trying to tell me that it's okay and that you're welcome here and um, I like you, you know? And that's very, very appreciated. And um, sometimes one of the awkward things that can happen at Interfaith uh, is that the physical, um, wanting to give a hug. I, I had a gentleman saying, I like you so much, can I give you a hug? And I was like, how about you give your wife the hug and I'll get the hug from her, you know? <laughs> and he did. He was a good sport about it. He hugged his wife and his wife hugged me. And so, you, again, every Muslim woman's different, but uh, if you want to know from an Islamic principle, then yes, there, there are uh, limitations to physical interaction. Also, air high fives. <laughs> okay, so those were the softer questions, I think. Uh, so now you'll be surprised to hear some of the tougher questions, but I'm glad these are being asked. Uh, so there's a whole bunch. Uh, why does the government of Saudi Arabia have such harsh punishments, such as beheading, stoning, etc.? Also, uh, the follow-up question from another person is, why are the Sunnis and Shias fighting with each other? Don't they realize that they're making it bad for all people? Who wants to take that? Nobody wants to take that. <laughs> Okay, so two pretty different questions. I'm going to deal with the second first because it's it's pretty easy to do. I want to know why are the Sunnis and Shias fighting? That's <laughs> what we all want to know. So I mean, it's why do why do people fight? Period. Right. Um, I think it's uh, in human history there are very few exceptions that that's what people do. There's power. There's greed. Um, there are the justifications for it that tend to be clothed in nobler things like freedom or religion or justice or protection. Etc. Um, but I think that's, you'd have to ask somebody who's an expert in geopolitics who'll probably bring in factors like the price of oil and the power of balance of the East and 
Uh, I'm not an expert on that, but you know, human beings tend, tend to um, misbehave sometimes. The first question is, is a good question. Um, why, can, can I say it again? Why does the government of Saudi Arabia have such harsh punishments, such as beheadings, stonings, etc.? Um, so the government of Saudi Arabia, I, I, I would just say, there is no government on earth that I think should be taken as representative of the religion. Okay? They are governments. Um, they have their implementations, whatever language they choose to clothe it in. Um, the question now becomes, does Islam hold things to be capital offenses? Um, and are there punishments that, are, are there crimes that are punishable by death? The honest answer is yes. Okay, now the question becomes, what are those and are they actually implemented? Uh, most scholars of Islamic law, there's a few, like there's a professor at Harvard, Noah Feldman, there, there's many who've written on this, um, would say that the quote unquote punishments in Islamic law, that, that would be capital offenses, are more deterrents, and they're meant to show the severity um, of it, other than treason, which I think most governments up until recent times would consider treason, uh, particularly in the war times, it's punishable by death. But for example, things like um, extramarital affairs, and things like that, that those were so impossible to actually prove um, in a court of Islamic law, which I apologize because I know there's younger folks here, that would have to have four adult testimonies who saw actual penetration. So it becomes like a ludicrous thing to ever try to prove in court, and they were really placed there as deterrents. Um, why these things happen in the modern world, I think, um, have to deal, have to do with uh, governments and who they choose to implement um, the law with, and who tends to get away with things um, under the law. Saudi Arabia is never discussed amongst Muslims as this bastion of justice and truth and Islamic law, and why couldn't we all be like that? Um, we tend to have pretty, and I want to be respectful to anybody who might be from Saudi Arabia. Um, it, it's not really seen. Most Muslims sort of loathe these things and see them as un-Islamic and how they're carried out and implemented, uh, etc. Um, but these are, again, complex. We're talking about governments. I can't speak for a government um, and why and when and how they do these things. Uh, but the, the Islamic legal system is one that um, presumes justice, sorry, presumes innocence, seeks justice. Um, actually, our model of the 12 jurors comes from a Muslim tradition that in the absence of a, uh, a judge that everybody agreed on, that you could have 12 peers that hear out the case, and if they were unanimous upon it, we're going back to the whole thing of, of, of unanimous, um, that, that, that uh, a person could be convicted or, or, or found uh, not guilty. Uh, sorry, I've been watching that making of a murder. Thing. <laughs> that's all on my mind now. Like, ah, how did I get it wrong? Um, but anyways, so that's that's uh, that's it in a nutshell. Is it's, I think it's complex when it comes to application. Um, I think our legal system is far from perfect, but I think if we can all agree that our ideals that we strive for, um, even those calling for reformations in our legal system would say our ideals are um, praiseworthy, it's our application that falls short. I think that would be somewhat simple. Thank you. All right, we have uh, two more tough questions. I'm just going to group this question, these two questions together. I know that Muhammad led some military campaigns. What is the Muslim teaching on war? And, and then the follow-up question, another person is, do you think ISIS's proclamation of war contradicts Muhammad's teaching of war? Okay. When, uh, you know, part of my conversion story, it was hard to dive into some of the details, but, you know, when I was a student at the Naval Academy, we, we learned about the laws of war. And, the, the laws of war that govern our conduct in the U.S. military is generally a corpus of, of, of literature that came out of the Geneva Convention in The Hague, and it's embodied in our UCMJ, our code of conduct during battle, how we treat the enemy, how we, you know, law of proportionality, all those things that you and I as citizens would say, we want our military to act in a just and fair manner during prosecution of war. Uh, notwithstanding some of the uh, you know, egregious violations that, that have been committed recently, but by and large, I think the nation tries to uphold that standard of, of just war. And when I read the, the, the section of, of the laws governing war in Islam, I was flabbergasted because it was so restrictive. You can't damage, you know, harm animals. You can't uproot a tree. You can't poison a river. You've got to stop fighting when they stop. You can only fight when attacked. And, and you, in, in the, you can never kill a non-combatant, including the military cook or the military doctor. It's only the arm-wielding individual coming at you that you can... It's so restrictive. I said, 
the Geneva Convention has got nothing on what's called the Sharia. Uh, Sharia is, is a law governing, a portion of it, it talks about uh, uh, during combat how you conduct yourself. So that concept kind of pervades throughout the, the body of, of Sharia, which is how we conduct ourselves in a civilized society, an element of which is born. So I hope that answers the question. I will uh, go with one more question about... Uh, does the ISIS proclamation of war contradict Muhammad's teaching of war? Yeah. So, yes, is the answer. Okay. Is that it? That's it, yes. Uh, Donald Trump is calling for the exclusion of Muslims being allowed to enter the country. While most people disagree with this, there is a problem with radicalized Islams carrying out terrorist acts in the United States. How can the Muslim community in the U.S. Uh, get more involved to help stop the terrorist threat? I think one of the false paradigms that, that my good friend alluded to earlier is, is we have to view the, what's going on more from a geopolitical standpoint. That has to be the framework of how we view these things as opposed to a religious standpoint, because you run, you keep running into the absurdities when you look at it from a religious standpoint. To say that Islam is the problem is to then say 1.7 billion people is the problem, is to then say 25% of humanity is the problem, is then to say we don't want them in our country. You see the absurdity of that, right? But when you look at what's going on more from a geopolitical standpoint, you know, the, the, the unintended consequences and, and the causal effects of war and violence and, and refugees and the crisis, then it starts to make a lot more sense. And then from that framework, I think we can start looking at crafting policies that are smart and intelligent. I mean, factually speaking, we talked about, you know, since I, I recently read a piece recently that um, since Sandy Hook, there's been, seven, these are FBI numbers, 70,000 gun-related violence America since Sandy Hook. And of the 70,000 deaths in America since Sandy Hook, gun related violence, of that, what was the number? 20, 25 were at the hands of Muslims. Now, when you look at that, you go, that's a pretty small percentage to begin with. But if you look at that from a geopolitical standpoint, you go, well, why might those people be pissed off? Right? Maybe because they're Iraqi and their entire village was bombed. So then we can start looking, and, and, and it gets to be tough, right? As citizens, you got to think to this. Well, you know, our country, as a military man, I, I've spent, done a lot in the U.S. Navy, and to be very candid, I, I've seen, this is pre-Muslim days, this is before I became Muslim, I, I've seen things that our country does really, really well. I've also seen things that our country doesn't do so well. So that's the reality, right? So I think we start looking at these problems from a geopolitical standpoint, what they are, not in, in absurdities, keep up, you know, keep out the Muslims. Who's next? Keep out the Catholics? Keep out the Jews? I mean, where do we stop? Okay, so we'll let Mahdi talk for a second, but before we do, uh, we're going to talk about his head. Uh, what is the significance of your hat, Mahdi? And then, and then you can talk about your, what you're going to say here as well. That question mentioned Trump, right? Uh, the previous yeah. one? Okay, um, I want to read you a, a quote from our uh, forefather, uh, George Washington, uh, which is very relevant today. And uh, what he said, there was actually, uh, there was a, a this, is, this is, I'm extrapolating this from a, uh, a study that synthesized George Washington's advice in 10 points on how to maintain a America with the values that the forefathers instilled in it. So there were 10 points that they gathered together from George Washington, and this is one of, one of the points um, was related to um, this quote. Real patriots who may resist the intrigues of the favorite are liable to become suspected and odious. While its tools and dupes 
usurp the applause and confidence of the people to surrender their interests. You following me? This is George Washington, right? 240 years ago. Thank you. It's not for me, it's for George Washington. Applause for George Washington. I'm going to read it one more time. Real patriots, meaning people standing with a conscience, people standing with a conscience for what is truly right, not what's popular, but what's truly right, based on time-tested principles, time-tested principles of what has have endured as the virtues and pillars of our society. Real patriots who may resist the intrigues of the favorite, the favorite meaning the popular, are liable to become suspected and odious. Liable to become suspected and odious. You know, I had a friend, he was working at a prominent law firm, great, from Michigan. He started volunteering for the Obama campaign. He put, he was making a lot of money at a big old national global law firm. He's making a lot of money. He put that on hold to volunteer for Obama eight years ago. Right? There was this campaign, and I know him, there's this campaign that dug something and found this where when he was a student in college, he was a part of this organization, and when he was a part of this organization, this organization had this one thing that said, you know, the Muslim Student Association, which every college has, right? And therefore, he became suspected and odious. And he had to, my friend, he had to resign from the Obama administration. Right? Even though he selflessly took, surrendered his salary from this law firm to go and volunteer. He, he had to leave that. He had to resign for the sake of the, you know, for the greater cause. He had to resign. And he was defamed, you know, defamation and whatever. And so he, 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 he suffered personally, right? But he was found to be what? He was found to be suspected and odious, right? And there are other examples. Huma Abedin, who works with Hillary Clinton, right? Doing good work, right? And so she becomes suspected and odious. While it's tools and dupes, right? Like today, this show that we have, it's all right, it's cool. It's just the event called to prayer. So we just entered our third prayer of the day. So after this, we're going to pray, right? So it's tools and dupes usurp the applause. Ha, 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 so funny. Rosie O'Donnell, ha, 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 let's laugh, right? While you're going to lead this country to God knows where, right? Usurp the applause and confidence of the people to what? Surrender their interests. So we're, we're, we're at stake in losing our liberty as Americans, right? Because of all this concocted, you know, whatever around the world. We're going we're gonna to lose our liberty and sorry. So, so yeah, my hat. Um, <laughs> my hat, it's basically, um, so in, in, our, in our Islamic law, there's things that are obligations. There are things that are prohibitions. There are things that are recommended, things that are disliked, things that are permissible. There's five categories in everything. It's a very rational, logical religion. Right? So one of the recommended or, or liked is kind of like extra credit, right? Uh, in, in, in the way, you know, in this opinion is that if you wear this hat, you know, then it's, that's it. But really for me, it means something deeper. It means two things for me. Deeper, for me, it means, um, for me, it means, uh, it reminds me, like when I put it on, I try to be present and mindful. That reminds me, you own me. I am a slave of God. I don't own myself. I don't own my money. I manage my money. I don't own my body. I manage my body. But he owns me. God owns me. So for me, this means I'm a slave of God. Right? That's what the deeper meaning. And the second thing it reminds me of is my identity. Like I talked about earlier. Like this is my American Muslim identity. You know? Like it means that I don't have to com I shouldn't compromise. Right? It'll be un-American. Right? If I compromise and, and hide myself and oh, I can't be different and all oh, this and that. So those are the two things that I want to add a brief comment, and I promise I'll keep it brief, just about Trump, etc. One of the paradigms that we buy into, even when we respond to that question, is we're acting like Muslims are some foreign thing out there, and they're not Americans here. Right? So even when we say, no, we should be letting Muslims in, that's the wrong answer. Right? And so what, what's been happening through the media is an, a, a, an intentional and deliberate otherization of Muslims. Right? And so we can't fall into that paradigm. 
So now, after all of these newscasts, when I say Muslim, you don't think of Muhammad Ali or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, right? You don't think of these people who are household names 20 years ago, right? Now you conjure up with some image that's just been implanted there. So I just, I, I really want to say that that's something I think we should reject because, you know, it's, it's interesting that over 45% of Muslims in America are the African American community. They didn't, they didn't immigrate here willing, willingly, right? <laughs> right? They're not recent immigrants here, and we try to pretend like no, but there's no threat of the other from them. Everybody knows them, so let's keep putting up these images of these foreign-looking men with turbans and beards and darker skin, olive-colored skin, etc. That's part of a deliberate machine, I believe, is my own sort of interpretation of what's behind it, in the otherization. So I think we as Americans, that's something that we should reject. As we, you know, when, when we think of Americans, we think of our own, as, and, and Muslims as our own. Thank you. So, 30-minute uh, Q&A. Uh, let's just go five minutes more to make sure we get uh, some more questions. Are you aware of any groups working to uh, against youth radicalization? And then the second part of the question is, do you know of any groups working to put pressure on mainstream media to balance their negative reporting of terrorism with positive stories of Muslims doing great work like peace, uh, feeding the poor, etc., to change the perception of American Muslims, uh, Americans towards Muslims? Who wants to take that? So I work with an organization, uh, it's, uh, it's based in Prima, it's called Te'alif Collective. Te'alif means binding together, bringing together. And so it's supposed to bring together all these things that are different and supposedly not supposed to be together, right? This paradigm, them and us, otherization, right? So yes, uh, we, we actively work with youth. Uh, we have uh, an inheritors program. And uh, in this program, uh, we work uh, diligently with youth on a weekly basis. Um, uh, and uh, that's, uh, and on a weekly basis, we have uh, local scholars and teachers um, conveying to them the, the uh, many different things. We have an etiquette class with them, but we also have a theological class with them, right? We have a, um, a, a class on, uh, on uh, how to practice Islam, but also on how to be, you know, uh, a beautiful American Muslim. You know, combining all these things. So we do on a regular basis, and this is just one example. There are there are so many. Like, like we said, you know, you you talk to all of us. We're not you're not you're not going to find any of us who see other than them. You know, every every youth program that you find in every mosque and everything out there uh, is going to counter the radicalization. But we don't see any radicalization. You know, so it's kind of like where is this stuff? Where is this stuff happening? It's like so. Where is it? Yeah, and then the second part of the question? Changing, changing, changing. changing media perceptions. Um, does anyone have anything? Um, do you guys remember the Ground Zero Mosque debates? Yes. Do you guys remember the intensity of the Ground Zero Mosque on the news prior to the midterm elections? Yeah. Did you notice the Ground Zero Mosque coverage post midterm elections? <laughs> Hardly a word about it, right? So that's an example of politicizing uh, a religion. Um, you know, you have to be, I think we have to be critical observers of the news. One simple thing is, when you've got so-called experts to talk about Islam, how many of them are actually Muslim? Virtually none. So, you know, it's, it's like asking a, a neurosurgeon to talk about, you know, how to make a hamburger. It's just, it's just there's no connection, right? I mean, we're going to talk about what Islam is and is not. Should you not ask a Muslim what Islam is or is not? But the so called experts are virtually never Muslim. So I think you have to be critical uh, uh, viewers of the news. Sorry, one sentence. I'm sorry to be the footnote guy. There, just to answer the question directly, there are efforts to um, influence media perception. The problem is it's all usually internet, you know, trying to make something go viral. It's, really hard to compete if you're not getting meet the press, if you're not on, I don't know if there's no Larry King line anymore, I just stated myself, but you know what I mean, right? If you're not as on these major news networks, it's, it's really hard to try to change a global narrative in a really big machine that's working against you, but there are definitely grassroots efforts. Can I add one thing as well? One thing that's um, changed in the Muslim community that I've seen myself, especially post 9-11, is my parents immigrated to America in the 1960s, and one thing that was very common in the Muslim world, the Muslim community here in America, 
is parents really push their kids to become doctors and lawyers and go in the business field. This is pretty much uh, my Muslim community is made up of people in those professions, um, businessmen and, and, and teachers. And so what's happened after 9-11 is there is a realization that we don't have enough Muslims in the arts. Um, the Jewish community was very good about that, about getting um, um, people from their community to get involved in the media. And we realized we, we're not making our own films, we're not telling our own stories. Even um, books that are taught in junior high about Muslims are written by non-Muslims, about Muslim teenagers or whatever. So we're finally having, starting to have people who are writing their own stories. But it's, it's very slow, it's not enough, but I've definitely seen that change. Okay, we just have two more questions that I promise we'll be done. Uh, what is the narrative structure of the Quran? How should one approach this book towards understanding it? Okay, um, so the Quran is, um, it should be thought of primarily as an oral tradition, right? Although we, we, it's written down and we read it, etc. Um, it is originally in the Arabic language and it's preserved in its original Arabic primarily. Um, if you're interested in learning about the structure, um, uh, themes, and content of the Quran, you're, it's a good time to ask because there's been a, uh, a phenomenal uh, contribution uh, in religious studies. It's called the Study Quran. Um, it's put out by Harper Collins. And um, there's a lot of beautiful essays written by experts on, on the topic. Um, but to frame it to you briefly, uh, the Quran is primarily broken up into chapters of varying lengths. Okay. Um, it is primarily a non-linear book. It doesn't tell, it's not a historical text. It doesn't go through, I mean, there are exceptions to that. There are historical passages therein, um, but you'll find shifting themes that are connecting, maybe not so obviously connecting dots between themes of um, faith on the one hand and then telling the story of Moses overcoming Pharaoh, um, followed by the need to give charity to the poor. And we may not see the connection, but there is a very intricate, um, uh, one, one of my teachers gave a, a wonderful proverb, uh, no, not a proverb, an analogy to understand it. He said it's sort of like when you come out to the stars at night, if you're not a stargazer, you, they look extremely random to you. Um, but if somebody, um, if you stare at them long enough and you become a stargazer, you'll start to realize that there's really intricate constellations that form patterns, etc. So for a Western modern mind, it's, it's challenging to read what is a non-linear, sort of non-historical narrative. Um, but these 114 chapters are of varying lengths. Um, they talk about, uh, there's seven main themes in them. One is obviously it's a self-revelation, so it talks, it's God telling us about himself and his nature uh, and what he wants of us. Um, and there's stories of the prophets. There's um, the story of Noah and Moses and Jesus and Mary. There's an entire chapter on Mary and her um, her virgin uh, pregnancy and the birth and the conception. Um, there are, in addition to that, there's just stories of previous peoples that we don't know and what happened to them. Um, so there, there is a historical component. There is um, talk of what is a virtuous life, loving the neighbor, giving charity, etc. There are, uh, there's talk of the afterlife. What is paradise? What are the pleasures of paradise? What are the torments of hell? Um, and so those two are always coupled as sort of whenever God, you'll, you'll see one of the patterns in the Quran is whenever there's a very difficult calling in the Quran, right? To love your neighbor, take care of the poor, the homeless. Um, then it's followed up with, remember the day of judgment is coming. And there's either great reward or torment is punishment. Sort of motivates the, the, the lazier selves uh, to sort of say, okay, maybe I should do something about it. Um, and so th those are some of the major themes of the Quran. Um, the shortest chapter is about three lines. I, mean, I can literally read the whole thing here in about 15 seconds. Um, and the longest is, is, um, is uh, several dozen pages as well. So it varies, um, but again, we believe it to be the verbatim word of God. Um, and so, and so it, it doesn't conform necessarily to the way a human would write it linearly. Uh, but there's, there's a, 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 a hidden sort of second layer of, of structure and meaning that I don't think I can summarize. So much. Okay, so this last question. Uh, I think we got through all the written questions best as I could. Uh, so I hope uh, that the panel will be here afterwards to kind of mingle with when I come up here to the stage. But the last question is this was a very important panel, but I feel you're kind of preaching to the choir. 
uh, how would it, uh, how, it would be great if Muslim leaders can reach out to people who are less open members the members of this audience who don't understand Muslims or have an opportunity to interact with them in a social setting like this. So how can this panel, can, can we as Muslims uh, reach out in meaningful ways to non-Muslims, people of other faith or non-faiths, and express our support for, and how can they better su uh, express their support for peace-loving Muslims? I think this is a good start, by the way. I don't, I don't think we should diminish what we've done here today. I'm, I'm a person, my heart is singing right now. No, really, it's a beautiful thing. So, you all coming together, I don't, I don't think we should minimize it. I really, I really do think, don't, don't underestimate what a group of, of sincere, well-intentioned, hard-working people by the grace of God can do. Um, and so for me, I didn't know what to expect coming in here. I, I won't lie, I didn't expect this many people on a Saturday afternoon to come and give their time and their attention and to listen with an open heart and an open mind. Um, there will be a ripple effect from this, I promise you. Each of you will go home, have a conversation with a loved one or a neighbor or a friend. So this is a starting point. I, I agree it's not going to be the solution. But the more of this we do and the more opportunities that we create for folks to listen and you encourage other people to come and listen, the more, as the verse that Sarah talked about, the more we get to know one another. Right? That us and them and all of the mystery will just sort of dissipate. And we'll be arguing over who's going to win the Super Bowls. <laughs> right? Uh, I think it's on us as individuals to get out into the community and um, be visible because it's really easy to stay home, stay in your community where it's comfortable. And I'm not a natural public speaker. I'm not comfortable being here, but I'm here because I want the opportunity to just let you see me and ask me questions and let's dialogue because I feel like it's our responsibility. So on a big, big scale effort, I can't say what's going to happen or how things are going to change, but I personally feel like this is my duty and I'm showing my kids and we have to get out there and talk to our neighbors. We have to smile when they're, we're in the grocery store. We have to stop being scared and just be neighbors. So I, I think that'll make a big difference. Um, even these little um, gatherings, interchanges in the grocery store, that kind of thing is, is where it starts. Um, it was really interesting. There was a Pew study that came out recently asking people what their opinions were of Muslims. The majority, unfortunately, had an unfavorable view of Muslims. But what, they, what came out of that study that was interesting was that of that majority that disliked Muslims, um, the, only a minority of them actually knew a Muslim. And then the minority that had a positive view, the majority of that minority knew a Muslim. They actually had Muslim doctors or neighbors or friends. So I think that what we realized from that is that it's really important to get out there and get to know each other. Muslims tend to be pretty insular. Um, we, we, you know, we do recognize that um, in today's world that Muslims look different and um, are holding on to uh, views and traditions that people may feel don't have a place in the modern world. So it, people can be defensive and it's just easier to be in our bubbles. But that is what we're realizing more and more, is that we have to get out of our comfort zones and get to know one another. And I was very moved by a, a young mom who came and approached us during the interval. And she said it was her son's first birthday today. And she left her son at home with her husband so that she could come and hear us. And she had tears streaming down her face just asking, what can I do? I believe this is a good world. What can I do to make it better for my child and teach my child to basically grow up and not be a hater? And this is what it is. You know, we, we like to think, like, growing up, I always thought that during the Civil Rights Movement, I would have been marching with the African Americans. And during World War II, I would have protested on behalf of the Japanese Americans who were interned. Or if I was in Europe during World War II, I would have protected the Jews you know, we're being persecuted. But the truth is, you don't know. It's easy to have hindsight and to look back and say, I would have been on the right side of history, but you don't know until you're in the moment. So everyone who's here today has made a choice. It's really easy to just believe the media, to believe the hate mongers, and not say, I want to actually go out and speak to people who practice the Islamic faith to find out really what they think and what they believe. So again, don't discount what you've done today. Very
All right, well, thank you so much uh, for coming out. Uh, we're just going to end here. Uh, this panel is willing to travel. We have a mic and we'll travel. Uh, so they, uh, they're they open to going anywhere. And then there's a, a, a sheet, I think, when you, when you came in, it says islamicspeakers.org. That's their website. So you can uh, use this panel or, or nothing. We're just going to end with a prayer real quick. And, uh, and then I'll, I'll let you go. So Mahdi. I'm going to make a prayer in Arabic and English. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, maliki yawm al-deen. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. Ihdina al-sirat al-mustaqeen. سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا جتنابا الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم يا رحمن يا رحيم يا لطيف يا كريم يا ودود يا رحمن يا رحيم يا لطيف يا كريم يا Dear God, we raise our hands to you, we open our hearts to you, as you are the capable, the strong, the powerful, the mighty, and we ask you to bless us and bless our families and bless this country with ease and gentleness and beauty. We ask you to show us the truth as the truth and help us follow it, to show us falsehood as falsehood and help us and protect us from it. We ask you to protect us from the conspiring of those who want evil in this world. We ask you to, to use each of us in gentleness as vessels of beauty. We ask you to help us in every possible way, in this life and in the next. We ask you to help us know you and to worship you in beauty. We ask you to protect us on the Day of Judgment and to gather us all in heaven with all of your prophets, with all of your messengers, and with all of the righteous saints that have existed throughout humanity. We return to you, we ask you to forgive us, and we ask you to bless the people organize this and to protect them and to bless them in this world and their families and in the next. And please, God, we ask you in this chaos and craziness in this world to please, as you are the source of beauty, to please in the source of mercy, to please shower us with beauty and mercy. Amin. Amin. wrap it up. Thank you so much for coming on your Friday afternoons. Please mingle with the with the speakers afterwards. Thank you.